It is my honor today to introduce to you Admiral Sunil Lanba, PVSM, ABSM, ADC to the President of India, Chairman Chiefs of Staff Committee and the Chief of the Naval Staff of the Indian Navy. Like Admiral Dhawan before him, Admiral Sunil Lanba is a Navigation and Direction Specialist and an alumnus of the National Defense Academy, Khadak Vasla, Defense Services Staff College, Wellington, College of Defense Management, Sikandrabad, and Royal College of Defense Studies, London. He has held sea-going commands on as many as four occasions, starting with the command of the mine countermeasure vessel, INS Kakinada, and going on to frigate INS Himgiri, and thereafter the guided missile destroyer, INS Ranvijay. And finally, the indigenous state-of-the-art guided missile destroyer, INS Mumbai. He has also been the executive officer of the aircraft carrier Virat and the fleet operations officer of the Western Fleet. On promotion to Vice Admiral, he served as the Chief of Staff of the Eastern Naval Command and therefore as the Commandant of the National Defense College. Admiral Lanba served as the Vice Chief of Naval Staff. He has had the distinction of being the Flag Officer Commanding-in-Chief of both Southern and Western Naval Commands. He assumed command of the Indian Navy as the 23rd Chief of the Naval Staff on 31st May 2016. I now invite Admiral Sunil Lanba to deliver the opening address. Shrimati Nirmala Sitaraman, Honorable Minister for Defense, Mr. Stephen Lovegrove, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Defense, United Kingdom, Admiral Virija Gururatne, Chief of Defense Staff, Sri Lanka, Your Excellencies, esteemed members of the Diplomatic Corps, Admiral R. K. Dhawan, Chairman Maritime, National Maritime Foundation and the former Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Shekhawat, the former Chief of Naval Staff, Flag officers, esteemed veterans, distinguished personalities from the industry and the academia, overseas participants, friends from the media, officers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. It's always a tough ta task to follow Admiral Dhawan and come onto a podium. It gives me immense pleasure today to see the participation of a large number of experts from diverse fields in this dialogue. It is indeed an honor to speak to such an audience. Any policy that is evolved through rigorous academic effort would always stand a better chance of success. It is, in, it is with this intention that the Indian Navy wholeheartedly integrates itself with the endeavors of the National Maritime Foundation. Today we are indeed proud to host the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue in partnership with NMF. My compliments to the Chairman and the Director NMF and their entire team who have worked closely with the Navy to give shape to this dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, a quick look at history reveals that nations in the Indo-Pacific have come a long way since the end of the Second World War and the era of colonization. Several countries in this region have emerged as global powerhouses in manufacturing as well as the service sectors and together contribute about 50% of global GDP. Today, three, words of, three of the world's top 10 economies and militaries are from this region, and aspirations all around are rising. Such spectacular development could not have been possible in an insulated environment. International trade remains the prime mover of economic progress. In case of Indo-Pacific, about 80% of trade originating from here is actually extra-regional. This region also is a vital source This region is also the vital source of hydrocarbons and other natural resources which power the growth engines around the world. 
Evidently, development in this region have far-reaching implications across the globe and everyone is keenly watching the behaviors of both the established and the aspiring. Ladies and gentlemen, certain challenges are inherent in any forward moment. In the context of the forward march of emerging powers in the Indo-Pacific, I would like to flag a few significant challenges and draw, then draw out opportunities for all stakeholders. All of us are aware that access to resources and market is critical for economic development. Everyone also appreciate that natural resources are limited and market expansion are also not easy to come by. Globalization in geographic terms means that the established and the aspiring would need to share this limited space. Unfortunately, this kind of sharing is not something which happens without friction. In my understanding, mitigating this friction would remain the primary challenge in the foreseeable future. In order to address this issue of peaceful management of international interaction, modern nations, states voluntarily commit themselves to certain governing frameworks. Most of these regulatory frameworks evolved through consultative processes under the umbrella of the United Nations. The process was of course led by the bipolar order that evolved post the Second World War. The global order did become unipolar in many ways after the disintegration of the USSR. How the rule of law largely prevailed. Today it is slowly becoming apparent that the pursuit of individual interests by new aspirants is increasingly coming in conflict with these widely expect accepted rules. This has exposed the fragility of the modern international governing structures. Many analysts have attributed this to the transition from a unipolar to a multipolar world order. Restoring the collective fate in a rule-based order, irrespective of who leads that order, is therefore the second challenge that I would like to flag. The recent churning of the global order has also prompted many nations to pursue aggressive international cooperation to seek new alignments in support of their respective national interests. However, with multiple states pursuing parallel ambitions, the cooperation agenda is getting colored by competition. Cooperation between two states on a particular issue may also have an indirect negative bearing on a third. This has perhaps led to competitive cooperation, and if I may use the term, such trends need to be watched carefully for its implication on the overall balance of power. A close look at this trend of competitive cooperation also reveals an underlying duality of several bilateral relations. Globalization and the resultant economic interdependence has given this particular peculiar attributes to several interac international interactions. While nations are amiable to partnerships in areas which are beneficial to both. Fierce competition may exist concurrently in areas where actions of one negatively impinges upon the interests of others. Managing such duality of concurrent cooperation and competition is certainly a major challenge for policymakers. Another concern that needs to be addressed is transparency of intent, political, economic, and military cooperation between two states to promote development and security would always be welcome. However, when such transnational activities take place between two economically and militarily unequal partners, the weaker nations must be watchful for any hidden intent under the garb of cooperation. India's overseas interactions have always been based on the sound principle of sovereignty, equality, and mutual respect. However, opaqueness of intent on part of certain powerful nations may gradually jeopardize the very sovereignty of the weaker partner and is therefore another challenge of modern times that we should be prepared to deal with. Ladies and gentlemen, why I flagged a few macro level challenges here, an optimist would always look at them as opportunities. However, turning challenges into opportunities is only possible for those who are willing to shoulder greater responsibility. At the recently concluded Raisina Dialogue, 
our external affairs minister, affairs minister mrs sushma swaraj amply articulated india's positive intent in such and all and i quote this is really a world in transition for the foreseeable future it appears that nations with growing capabilities and larger awareness will have to step forward and bear more responsibilities unquote ladies and gentlemen the well being of our respective population would invariably remain the foremost universal priority for all of us this concept of well being has several associated aspects for now i would like to focus on the economic well being and a sense of security there are at the core of the very idea of well being therefore i would like to highlight the opportunities which have a direct bearing on these two aspects of well being with a substantially large continental landmass strategically significant maritime geography abundant natural resources in a large volume of skilled workforce the economic opportunity for india and its partners are immense the market potential of a growing india is already well acknowledged the government of india has taken several new initiatives to unleash the true potential of these core strengths this opens up several trade and investment opportunities for our international partners who would concurrently benefit from the growth of the indian economy you would agree with me that international trade cannot flourish unless it is backed by robust physical connectivity to this end india has already made significant progress in several regional connectivity projects the indian myanmar thailand trilateral highway the kaladan multimodal project are expanding eastward the proposed extension of this project to cambodia and vietnam will further consolidate india asean connectivity the chabahar port project in iran has opened up trade routes westward well into central asia in partnership with japan india has also articulated its vision of asia africa growth corridor and several steps are being taken to realize this vision projects of such magnitude demand collaborated international effort and presents a plethora of opportunities for public and private enterprise both domestic and international while land and sea connectivity is certainly important there is no denying the fact that the maritime medium remains a preferred highway for international trade with growing volume of energy and trade flow this medium will be even more critical to sustain the upward growth trajectory of transnational trade accordingly a significant amount of collaborative effort of focus on enhancing maritime connectivity this is ably supported domestically by the ambitious sagarmala project aimed at port led development through capacity enhancement of port and back end connectivity to industrial centers the upward curve of economic ambition also puts severe demand on natural resources and as we inch closer to the limits of continental resources of energy and other natural resources there is increasing focus on exploring sea based resources ladies and gentlemen in our pursuit of economic ambitions we must not lose sight of our responsibilities towards our future generations it is our responsibility that growth remains sustainable and does not undoubtedly harm the very environment that we live in adherence to the tenets of blue economy would guide us towards such an effort significant opportunities have been identified in this relatively new field and this subject was being deliberated at length during the annual maritime power conference conducted by nmf last year and we would be reviewing the progress made in this very important maritime field and i am hopeful that the participant will draw correct lessons from the deliberations here ladies and gentlemen i will now turn to the second aspect of well being which is the sense of security growth can only foster growth can foster only in an environment conducive of peaceful interaction international interaction with specific reference to indo pacific the building blocks of regional stability primarily mutual trust transparency of intent and respect for sovereignty appears to be under stress evidently such environments directly impinge upon regional security dynamics predominance of the maritime domain in the regional context 
highlights maritime security even further. Therefore, I'd like to use this opportunity to outline broad, broad contours of our outlook towards regional maritime security. Being the primary manifestation of maritime military power of a nation at the heart of the Indian Ocean, we in the Indian Navy are deeply conscious of our responsibilities towards ensuring that good order and a sense of security prevails in the region. Today, our ships and aircrafts are deployed across the length and breadth of the Indo-Pacific, almost round the clock. Such presence not only reassures seafarers of safety of, from all kinds of non-traditional threats, but also keep traditional threats at bay. The span of our deployments has also, be, has also proved we have great value to the Indian Navy to emerge as the first responder during many natural calamities in the region and beyond. Our capacity and capability to execute large-scale non-combatant evacuation from far-flung war-torn countries brought relief to thousands of citizens irrespective of nationalities. Such track records have earned the Indian Navy the repute of being the net security provider in the IOR. We would continue to put in sustained effort in pursuit of our own national interests and those of our friendly maritime neighbors. While the capability development and maritime posture of the Indian Navy is oriented towards preserving the stated maritime interest, we are acutely aware that a larger sense of maritime security can only be achieved through cooperative and participative regional security architecture. To this end, we have always strived to coordinate our effort with all regional and extra-regional stakeholders with genuine respect for the concept of sovereignty, equality, and universal good. This sentiment is echoed repeatedly at the highest level through the articulation of the philosophy of Sagar, meaning the ocean, which stands for security and growth for all in the region, and India's maritime cooperation initiatives are precisely based on such outlooks. Going beyond traditional activities of maritime cooperation, there exists tremendous scope for broadening the scope of international maritime cooperation. We have already executed several information sharing agreements with our international partners and are looking forward to expanding this grid further. In today's highly digitalized world, immense potential also exists for cooperation in space and cybersecurity domains. We remain committed to working together in these evolving fields. Ladies and gentlemen, you, are, you will all agree that pursuit of a stable Indo-Pacific requires cooperation and collaboration to be enhanced, connectivity to be optimized, and competition to be managed so that it does not escalate into conflict. In this context, I would like to share some questions that often come to my mind, and the panelists and the participants in this dialogue may take these questions forward over the next two days. First. There is an abundance of international mechanisms and equally robust policy frameworks for governance of the oceans across the globe. What is missing is perhaps voluntary compliance. What can we do to persuade occasional defaulters to desist from such tendencies? Secondly, India by nature believes in complementary rather than competitive transactions. It is our strength and not a weakness. How can we propagate this thought so that the unilateralism makes way for cooperative development and coercion makes way for collaboration? And thirdly, in recent times, national leaders across the Indo-Pacific have displayed a distinct maritime inclination in their respective pol policy priorities. Such conversions of views among national leaderships across the region can be taken forward by the respective maritime agencies to translate words into action. And in this regard, I would like to urge the participants to aim at policy coordination as the end result of dialogue. I am confident that several such issues will be deliberated at length during the course of the dialogue, and I wish all participants very fruitful discussions. But once again, like to thank the organizing committee for the painstaking effort in putting together such a fine event and all the eminent panelists for being here to share their expertise with all the participants. On behalf of the proud men and women in white, I extend my best wishes to all of you present here. 
Thank you very much, and Jai Hind.